The first thing that we need to do is draw a free body diagram showing the forces acting on the skier as she slides down this ski slope. Now of course we have the gravitational force pulling straight down on the skier and then we also have the normal force which is perpendicular to the surface. So it's basically pointing along the positive y-axis. And then we have this third force. The question notes that there is a wind force with component F sub x acting on the skier. Now, for now, we have drawn that wind force pointing up the slope in the positive direction of the x-axis. Now, it may turn out that as we solve this question that that is an improper assumption. And here's how that would work. If we end up calculating a positive value for f sub x, then our assumption that it's pointing up the positive x-axis will be correct. But, on the other hand, if we end up calculating a negative value for f sub x, then our assumption it's pointing up the ramp was incorrect, and we should turn it around and point it the other way. So just keep that in mind as we solve for f sub x. We do know that the skier is traveling down the slope in the negative direction of the x-axis, so we've also just labeled the velocity vector pointing towards the negative direction of the x-axis. Now, after drawing these three forces, the next thing that we need to do is figure out the angles that are associated with these forces. This is very, very important. And before we do that even, we actually want to figure out what this angle is right here. We're just going to call that theta. This will turn out to be an important angle in solving this question. Now, if we look carefully, we do have ourselves a right triangle right there. And we can actually label the right angle here. Now, of course, the sum of the angles in a right triangle is 180 degrees. So we know that that 90 degree angle plus the 10 degree angle plus theta has to equal 180 degrees. And if we solve that for theta, we will see that theta is equal to 80 degrees. So we're going to go ahead and label that in the picture. And now comes the reason why we decided to find that angle. When you measure your angles, what you really want to do is measure them relative to the positive direction of the x-axis. So when we're looking for the angle for the gravitational force, which is pointing straight down, the angle that we really wish to measure is from the positive x-axis in this counterclockwise direction all the way to the mg or gravitational force. So that's the angle that we actually need for the gravitational force. Now how do we find that? Well, we start on the positive x-axis, we travel 180 degrees to get to the negative x-axis, but then we also have to add 80 more degrees onto that to get to mg. So in other words, we have to take 180 and add 80 to it. Of course, that would give us an angle of 260. So that's the angle that we're going to use in a moment for the gravitational force. It's 260 degrees. Now, for the normal force, which is this force right here, we are, again, measuring it from the positive x-axis. We can hopefully see that that angle to the normal force is simply 90 degrees. And then finally, for f sub x, which is pointing along the positive x-axis already, the angle for that force is going to be 0 degrees. So let's keep those three angles in mind as we set up the following force table. So here is that force table, and what this does is it helps us stay organized, and it also helps us determine the x and y components of the forces. So we'll start with mg. Remember, the angle for mg was 260 degrees. So what this means is that for the x component, you're going to take the force mg, and you're simply going to multiply that by the cosine of 260 degrees. You can always use the cosine for the x component if your angle was measured from the positive x-axis. That's the key. So for the y component, we will have mg multiplied by the sine of 260 degrees. Now we move on to fn, and we take fn. Remember, the angle was 90 degrees. So for the x component, we'll multiply by cosine of 90 degrees. For the y component, we'll multiply by the sine of 90 degrees. And then for fx, we would have fx times the cosine of its angle, which was 0 degrees. And then the y component is fx times the sine of 0 degrees. Now, the next thing you would do is you would apply Newton's second law in both the x and y directions separately. So let's take a look at what we mean by that. For the x direction, you would say that the f net in the x direction is equal to the mass of the skier multiplied by the acceleration in the x direction. So we're just going to be focused on the x direction right now. Remember, there are three forces, so we just add them together to get this f net x. So we'll be looking in our force table at these three forces for the x direction we would have mg times the cosine of 260 degrees plus f sub n times the cosine of 90 degrees 
and then plus f sub x times the cosine of zero degrees. And then we're gonna set this equal to the mass of the skier times the acceleration in the x direction. Now, before we turn to the y direction, let's see if we can simplify this. We have the cosine of 90 degrees, which is zero. So f sub n times zero will zero out. So that's gonna kind of cancel out. And then the cosine of zero degrees is actually equal to one. So f sub x times one is just f sub x. So let's just rewrite our equation. And then finally, since the question is asking us to figure out the value of f sub x, it might be wise for us to subtract this mg cosine 260 from both sides of the equation. That way we can kind of isolate the f sub x. So we have the following value for f sub x. And there we have it. Now let's turn to part A and see if we can answer this. I know we haven't looked at the y direction right now, but we might be able to answer the question without even looking at the y direction, which would be nice, of course. So in part A, they remind us that the velocity was constant. So when velocity is constant, recall that that means the acceleration in the x direction, as well as the y direction, would equal zero. So we're gonna actually plug in zero for this acceleration in the x direction right here. And then the mass of the skier was given to us as 40 kilograms. So let's go ahead and plug everything in and we can actually calculate for f sub x in part a. So we've plugged in the known values there. Recall, of course, that g has a value of 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, when you punch this into your calculator, you should see that f sub x is approximately 68 newtons. Now, notice it came out positive. So recalling our earlier discussion, if we do get a positive value, then our assumption that f sub x was pointing uphill or in the positive x direction was correct. So the direction of f sub x in this part of the question is indeed uphill. So let's just make a note of that. Now we can look at part B. Now part B tells us that the velocity is increasing at a rate of one meter per second squared. Let's make sure we understand what's going on here. Recall that the skier's velocity was pointing in the negative x direction. So kind of downhill was the direction of the velocity. Now, if that velocity is increasing, that means that the acceleration must also be pointing downhill in the negative x direction. So in other words, whenever you have an increasing velocity, then the acceleration and the velocity vectors must point in the same direction. So be careful here, because we're actually going to end up plugging in an acceleration in the x direction of negative 1.0 meters per second squared. Now, what are we plugging into? Well, we can plug into that very same equation that we developed earlier. So this equation here, which was sort of our Newton's... Sorry about that, there was a little technical glitch with my program here, but we were going to plug into this Newton's second law equation, which I'm trying desperately to circle here, that we developed earlier in our solution process. So let's take that Newton's second law equation, let's paste it down below, and then this time, for the acceleration, instead of plugging in zero, as noted, and it somehow disappeared, we're going to be plugging in an acceleration of negative one meters per second squared. So we're filling that in right here, along with the mass and the value of g. There we go, everything has been plugged in with units omitted for clarity and brevity. We can see that the force F sub X is now equal to approximately 28 newtons, it's still positive. So again, our assumption that it was directed uphill was still a correct assumption. So we'll just tag a direction of uphill onto our answer. This is the correct answer to part B. Let us finally look at part C. So in part C, this time the velocity is increasing at a rate of two meters per second squared. So just one more time, recall velocity is pointing that way. Acceleration has to also be pointing that way in order for the velocity to be increasing. So we are once again going to plug in an acceleration of negative two meters per second squared because the acceleration vector is pointing down the ramp in the negative x direction. So here is our equation and we're just going to plug in everything that we know one more time. And this time, when we calculate this f sub x, we're going to get about negative 12 newtons. So now we need to be careful because we got a negative value for f sub x. So our assumption that it was pointing in the positive x direction was a incorrect assumption. It's actually pointing in the negative direction as our calculations show. So rather than the f sub x pointing uphill, it's actually going to be pointing downhill in part C of this question. So the final answer to part C will be that f sub x is approximately 12 newtons, and this time it is pointing downhill. And this is the final answer to part C of this question.
Thanks for taking the time to watch the video. If you're interested in making a small donation to my cause, I would greatly appreciate it, but please do not feel obligated to do so.